Welcome, everybody. It's good to see you, students, guests, faculty, staff. This is the first Forrester Lecture of the 2019-2020 academic season. We have an exciting slate for you this year, and so I'm really happy to uh, begin this year with Dr. Fritz Schaefer. Um, at these types of events, one of the things we do is we introduce people, and so I'm going to take it a step further and I'm going to introduce the person who's introducing the speaker. Um, so yeah, wrap your mind around that. Um, Dr. Bill Bordeaux is a professor emeritus of chemistry at Huntington University. He taught here for many years, advised many students, pushed several of them successfully on to uh, PhDs and rewarding careers as chemistry faculty. Um, Bill Bordeaux is good friends with our speaker, and so I think it's awesome that he gets to introduce Fritz this evening. So I would like to introduce Dr. Bill Bordeaux. Nobody ever did that when I'm in class, but uh, I didn't expect it. I'm just a random stranger who was walking down the street and said, would you like to do this? I said, sure. Uh, Henry Schaefer um, received his BS degree in chemical physics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, by the way, I taught a lot of organic and biochem while I was here. His chemistry career started off literally with a bang when an explosion he, he caused, trashing a fume hood at MIT, um, created quite a bit of damage. Uh, upon seeing it, his instructor quipped, Schaefer, have you ever considered theoretical chemistry? <laughs> that statement turned out to be prophetic. As uh, Dr. Schaefer has commented, I quote, I found chemical engineering to be boring, and the explosion was fun, but I was very slow in the lab. In his quantum mechanics course during his junior year, Dr. Schaefer found the elegant and counterintuitive language of quantum, quantum physics simply beautiful. This was his first real passion for anything in science and came at an opportune time because the field he was going to enter was just now developing powerful enough computers that could simulate molecules that were quite complex compared to what had been true before. To, and they could make predictions that hadn't yet been seen or they could make predictions on things that could not be replicated in the lab. So they were doing their experiments on computers. He received his PhD in chemical physics from Stanford University and then went on to spend 18 years as professor of chemistry at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'd, I would say Schaefer's big breakthrough professionally came in 1970 as an assistant professor when he and his friend Charlie Bender showed that the best structure for a very tiny, unstable molecule called ethylene uh, I won't tell you what it was because he's going to talk about that. But basically, he um, refuted the work of a Nobel Prize winning chemist who had won the Nobel Prize for this discovering what he called the theoretical uh, structure of methylene, and he was wrong. So that was kind of what put him on the map. Uh, upon reading his paper, there were two excellent experimental groups that started working on the problem and actually within a few months published a paper vindicating Dr. Schaefer's calculations. Since 1987, Dr. Schaefer has been Graham Purdue Professor of Chemistry and Director of the Center for Computational Chemistry at the University of Georgia. And Huntington has the uh, distinction of having uh, three, well, I'm sorry, having two PhD chemists come through his program and one who is finishing his PhD. You, some of you may know who Michael Bowman is, but I'm not sure you will. Uh, he graduated from Huntington recently, and he's going to be getting his PhD probably next May. So we're, we're glad for that connection. Uh, Dr. <coughs> Excuse me, Dr. Schaefer uh, spends a lot of time in airplanes. Uh, his academic appointments include visiting professorships at the University of Paris, the Australian National University, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and the University of Zurich, and he's an honorary professor at Fudan University in Shanghai. Uh, he does travel quite a bit. 
He's the author of more than 1,500 scientific publications. He has lectured at nearly 300 national and international conferences. In 2014, he was named as one of the 50 most influential scientists in the world, and he was given the Peter Dubai Award in Physical Chemistry by the American Chemical Society in that same year. This year in May, he received the gold medal from the American Institute of Chemists, and next year, a symposium in Dr. Schaefer's honor will be held at the International Chemical Congress of the Pacific Basin Societies. It's my pleasure to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Henry F. Schaefer. Thank you, <clears throat> Professor Bordeaux. It's good to be here. Um, I've actually been here many times and have a, a debt to Huntington University of, in terms of my three PhD students who have uh, all gone on to a wonderful um, scientific careers, all, all professors at, uh, at Christian colleges. Um, what else should I say about Huntington? I've been coming here for more than 20 years, uh, about once every five years, and uh, it, it's, it's always uh, special. I'm always looking for that next genius in the chemistry program, so uh, if you are such a person, please identify yourself. So here's my title, and uh, let's see. If, yeah, this is where we work. This is the Center for Computational Quantum Chemistry. It's a new uh, building, a um, wonderful place to, uh, to do research in our field. I think the first building... Uh, constructed, at least in North America, to uh, focus on computational chemistry. These are the people that do the work. Um, let's see. Does, does this thing have a laser pointer on it, too? Okay, so let's see. Pressing the red button, that does it. Here's Michael right up here. Well, I'm going to have to get a little closer. Uh, that's Michael kind of right there. Yeah, he was a star. He and his wife, Christine, were both stars on your track and cross-country teams. He is um, interviewing for a faculty position today with the enemy, Taylor University. <laughs> but uh, there won't be any new spots in chemistry in Huntington for the next 30 years, so uh, no place for him here. Uh, let's begin with some general uh, comments on an important topic. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll skip that. I don't want to take too much time on this. Uh, yes, we were talking about this at dinner tonight. Um, Eugene Wigner, Nobel Prize winner in physics, Princeton University, liked to talk about what he called the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Now, I have had students who have told me rather directly that they had not found mathematics to be very effective, and uh, this was confirmed by some of their professors as well. Um, Wigner remarked that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift that we neither understand nor deserve. Now, of course, when we talk about gifts, someone's doing the, the giving, and, and for Wigner, that was the, the sovereign god of the universe. Rick Smalley <coughs> was a very good friend of mine, father of nanotechnology, Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1996. He was a very outspoken atheist until the last five years of his life. Um, he knew me to be a Christian, so we had some lively discussions. Um, I'd see him, and Rick would say to me, Schaefer, are you still a Christian? Say, yeah, still am. Smalley, are you still an atheist? Yeah, still am. And uh, so that, that went on for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> but something happened five years before he passed, and he describes it this way. He said, recently gone back to church regularly with a new focus. He joined the First Baptist Church in Houston, Second Baptist Church in Houston, and, uh, and was baptized there. Uh, and uh, he hadn't been to church in, I'd say, at least 40 years. You know, he had no interest in church, whatever. He was derisive in his discussions of church. Gone back to church regularly to understand uh, as best I can what it is that makes Christianity so vital and powerful in the lives of billions of people today. Even though almost 2,000 years have passed since the uh, death and resurrection of Christ, and this is the key note, although I suspect I will never fully understand, I now think the answer is very simple. It is true. Uh, great uh, statement. His life was changed. He was, a, 
he was a different person for the last uh, five years of life, and everyone could, uh, could, uh, could see it. Charlie Towns, <clears throat> maybe the greatest experimental scientist of the 20th century, discovered the laser, something that has impacted every single life. Uh, this audience is very unsymmetrical. They like those seats over there. Nobody's there, and they're all over there. What's going on here, Bill? Asymmetrical, well, all right. Yeah. If, I were, if I were at the University of Georgia, I would make these young people move down toward the front. But I, I'm, 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 I'm not at home, so I won't do that. <clears throat> Charlie discovered the laser in, uh, in 1958, got the Nobel Prize just six years later, which is an unusually short period of time between the discovery and the recognition. And this is from his uh, autobiography, and last chapter, Spiritual Views, from a scientific base. And this is what he says. There are other things in this, in this last chapter of his book that are good as well, but this one's okay. It says, in my view, the question of origin seems always to be unanswered if we explore from a scientific view alone. Thus, I believe there is a need for some religious or metaphysical explanation. I believe in the concept of God and in his uh, existence. And he talks about his life as a member of the Christian community there. And... Um, he lived to be 99. At age 75, he had a, um, a refreshing uh, experience of, of Christ. Uh, uh, he had been a Christian, but it all became much more real to him uh, at the age of 75, which is interesting. Uh, Bill Phillips, <clears throat> Nobel Prize in, uh, in Physics 1997 for the development of methods to cool and trap lasers, atoms with laser light. And this is his statement the day he the day it was announced that he was going to receive the Nobel Prize. He said, God has given us an incredibly fascinating world to live in and explore. Uh, and then it goes on. That's on the front page of the New York Times. Then on page 8, you know, where the details occur. There are interesting things here. It says that he forms and sings in the gospel choir of Fairhaven United Methodist Church, a multiracial congregation of about 300 in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He also teaches Sunday school and leads Bible stories. And one of the things that it said in, the, in that article in the New York Times is uh, every Saturday afternoon, he and his wife drive into uh, D.C., 25 miles away from Gaithersburg, and they, they uh, pick up um, an elderly, 80-year-old um, at that time, African-American woman, and take her out for her grocery shopping for the week, and then they have dinner with her. And that's, that's their idea of, uh, of uh, a way to spend uh, Saturday afternoon and evening. So pretty, uh, it's, there's a genuineness there. Now, I have five points. <clears throat> Coming of age story, story of science, a love story. This is what you're going to like the best, unless you're completely different from any other audience I've spoken to. Story of faith, story of international scientific collaboration. So that's where we're going to try to go, and we hope to get there. I was born in Grand Rapids, Michigan, not far from here. Yeah, we're in the north of Indiana, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. I, I, so I've uh, st lasted one year. My father was born in, in Grand Rapids. His father moved from Evansville, Indiana, to Grand Rapids about the year 1900. Uh, so I don't remember anything from that age. We moved to, uh, let's say a little bit about my parents. My parents were, um, were not Christians, but they were uh, wonderful people, humanly speaking, always deeply concerned about my well-being from my birth until the month in which they both died, February of 1988. Parents were lovers of education. Both were graduates of the University of Michigan. Go blue. We had, had somebody at dinner tonight from Ohio, and that was, you know, that reminds me of many recent football losses to Ohio State, but this year we're going to take them. This is it. This is our year. We, yeah, we so go blue. Uh, my father was a civil engineer. My mom uh, it graduated from journalism. And then we moved to Syracuse you know, from ages one day. Don't remember too much from that. There was a lot of snow there, but never enough. When you're a little kid, when it snows, you just wish there'd be more and more and more. Uh, and there was plenty, plenty there. So I can't tell you too much more about that. Then we moved to the promised land. Then we moved to the promised land. Menlo Park, California, now uh, a part of Silicon Valley. Um, but uh, it, was, um, it was a wonderful childhood there. Um, tell you a little bit about it. 
Uh, we lived only two miles away from Stanford uh, University. Stanford University owns thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of land, most of it still undeveloped. And um, many days after school uh, and, and weekends were spent exploring uh, this, uh, one of the most beautiful campuses in the world. And I'll come back to that situation nine years later. Ultimate questions. Uh, before leaving from California to Michigan, I had not given much thought to deep questions such as, is there anything beyond the universe we know? Is there a purpose to the universe? Is there a purpose to human life? Does God exist? Is there life after death? Uh, these are questions that every young person asks, or virtually every young person Yes, and, and I began asking those kind of questions. Well, left the promised land, back to Grand Rapids. Here I am, just, uh, what am I, about um, two hours north of, of uh, is it three hours to Grand Rapids? How, long, how far to Kalamazoo? Because it's only one hour from Kalamazoo. Yeah, I think, I think I can get to Grand Rapids in less than three hours. Uh, so I went to high school there. Went to high school there, and now this story becomes a lot more interesting. Uh, at age 18, my, um, what, this would have been my junior year in high school, I was in study hall. A lot of people don't know what study hall is anymore unless they saw it in a movie named Study Hall or something like that. But, but we would gather in a room about this size, all the people that didn't have class, and we were supposed to study. Now, uh, I did some studying uh, there, um, but... This one day, a beautiful girl from the grade below mine walked up to the auditorium stage to sharpen her pencil. There was one, we had only, we didn't have pens back then, couldn't afford them, but there was a pencil at, uh, up in the stage right about there, and she came up, and that was the beginnings of my struggles with atrial fibrillation. That, that's where it started. I mean, it was just unbelievable that, uh, that such a beautiful girl could exist, and sad, because I was a nerd. How can I be sure that I'm a nerd? Uh, I was the second tallest boy in the high school and couldn't make the freshman chemistry team. But all you had to do was be able to take two steps forward to make the freshman chemo, uh, a basketball team. I had the, 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 the standard problems, couldn't jump and couldn't run. And so I knew I was a nerd. And in fact, at that point, I, I, I realized that I was going to have to find something else to do than play in the NBA. This girl was so beautiful, the thing so sad about it is she did not look like someone who would be attracted to a nerd such as I. Um, searching for truth. Well, I'm starting to think about things at age 17. Somewhere between my junior and senior year in high school. It's going to take 11 years, though, before um, I become a Christian. <clears throat> but I began to read the Bible. This was a book that was foreign to me. Uh, but I did it for two reasons. First, I, I wanted to be an educated person. I was realizing by then that since there was no future in athletics, I needed to become educated. I knew the Bible to be the most widely quoted book in the world, and I didn't know a lot about Jesus, but it seemed to me that he was unlike anybody I ever met or, or read about, <clears throat> and I wanted to familiarize myself with more along those lines. University choices... Uh, my father wanted to be a st student at either Stanford or, or MIT. MIT, of course, the greatest nerd university still in the universe. And uh, it used to be embarrassing to describe myself as a nerd, but that was before Bill Gates said the world's going to be run by nerds. Uh, I, I haven't had any role in running the world yet, but um, it's good to be a nerd. There are nerds in this room. I know. Now, I'm not going to describe your two chemistry professors as nerds, but if they want to self-identify... That's okay. Aaron, are you going to? I won't confirm or deny. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> great. Got into both universities, chose to go to MIT. That's where my dad wanted me to go. And so off I go to um, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, right next to Boston, and I'm there for four years. Now, um, MIT, the architecture at MIT is truly ugly. It, I'm, I'm serious. It, uh, the... the um, the main building, still the main building, was when I was there, is about a third of a mile long, and it looks much more like a penitentiary than a, than a university building. I mean, it is, it is grim. 
Uh, they've built new buildings since then, of course, and, and they are remarkably unesthetic. There is one good view at MIT, the view of the Great Dome. Here it is right here, the only beautiful building on the MIT campus, and the, the library is right underneath that, and um, I spent a lot of time there, and whenever people, whenever the parents come to see their, their children, uh, they take pictures, that picture right there. First two years, first, my first year was a shock. Uh, it was disappointing. My grades were only average, maybe a little bit better than average, but not, uh, not much. This was a surprise to me because I came from a good public school, East Grand Rapids High School, and had done well there. Um, but uh, first year was tough. Second year, amazing. I became one of the best students at MIT. Nobody more surprised than I was. And so what, uh, what happened? Well, it's not like I'd spent a lot of time studying over the summer. Uh, what happened was this. Um, many of my classmates at MIT had come from all science high schools. I don't know if they have those in Indiana or not, but the Bronx School of Science is a high school in, in New York that has produced 16 Nobel Prize winners in physics. That's not bad for a high school. So a huge number of these students were coming from places where they already studied all the subjects we had to take as freshmen at MIT. And it was just like a year of review. And, and I was just, it wasn't a year of review for me. I was working really hard and it took a little while to catch up with them. And that I find that still be true of, of some students most everywhere I go. Teachers at MIT, we'll let this pass. Uh, yeah, we'll let this pass. Your, uh, your uh, chemistry professors will like this. And you told my George Whitesides story, too. Uh, he was, George Whitesides is the professor that asked me the question, have you ever considered theoretical chemistry? I'd never heard the words theoretical and chemistry put together. This is my first semester of my sophomore year, but... Um, he, he predicted uh, my future. Whiteside's had a pretty good future, too. He's won everything but the Nobel Prize. He's the most highly cited chemist, maybe the most highly cited uh, scientist in the world. So he got me on the road to theoretical chemistry. Now, calculus is very valuable. Calculus is very valuable. The beautiful girl up here sharpening her pencil, she's a year behind me at uh, East Grand Rapids High School. After I'm gone, she becomes the homecoming queen. Hardly a surprise. Hardly a surprise. But, uh, you know, nerds uh, uh, don't have social skills, and, and they're not good looking. They can't run. They can't jump. But they're smart sometimes. And I managed to introduce myself to this, uh, this beautiful girl. Now, she wouldn't be interested in me at all, but she wasn't the typical homecoming queen. She... she she hated being the homecoming queen. She said, I never wanted all that attention. She hated being the homecoming queen, and she didn't care for the football players. She was supposed to be in love with one of the football players. She went to the football games, but she, she didn't like. Anyway, I got to know her. She went to Wells College in, uh, in, in western New York, uh, women's college. Um, it's now co-ed. And um, she wrote me a letter halfway through her well, I think it was in February. I mean, I remember this letter telling me what it was like to be a freshman at Wells College. I mean, it was really a nice letter, and she signed it, your Wells Bell. Wow. Now, that was just for fun. I mean, all the women at Wells College described themselves as Wells Bell. I didn't know that at the time, but uh, anyway, so I got to know her, and the, um, uh, and the next summer, I'd finished two years in MIT, and uh, she'd finished one year at Wells College. And um, I was doing nerd stuff. I was going to advance place third-year calculus. I'd done well. And actually, I didn't do that great in first-year calculus for reasons I told you. Did great in second-year calculus. And I said, I know, I know how to do this stuff. I'm going to study third-year calculus over the summer, advance, place it, and go right into fourth-year calculus. Yeah, because that's what nerds do. And uh, so the homecoming queen calls me on the telephone. Now, this is shocking back then. I mean, young women did not call young men on the telephone back then. It just wasn't, you weren't supposed to do it. She called me, and I, I was shocked. And uh, her first, and she, this, she was very direct about this. She said, Fritz, do you know anything about calculus? I said, well, actually, I do know quite a bit about calculus, and I'm learning more every day. 
And she said, maybe you can help me. And I said, well, so she explains this problem they've got in the household. Her brother is trying to get into medical school, <clears throat> but he never took calculus as, um, as an undergraduate. And um, they've told him that he can come if he passes calculus, the first semester of calculus, with a B or better over the summer. <clears throat> so he's taking uh, first year calculus, first semester calculus, it's Grand Rapids Junior College, which the bar is not very high. And he's managed to fail the first two quizzes. And uh, he's seeing the dream of medical school rapidly fading. So she explains all this to me and says, do you think you could help us? And I said, well, I'll, I'll be glad to try. And, and uh, I said to her, well, when, when should I come? She called about 6 o'clock at night said, can you come now? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll come. <laughs> so I go there. And, I mean, this was an uphill battle. Uh, it was worse than I've described. He, his last... Uh, math course was geometry. He'd never had calculus, and he has this, he's taken this course with, in which uh, he'd never had trigonometry, and trigonometry is a prerequisite, and so I'm teaching him trigonometry, calculus, the whole deal. And um, this was intense. This was 50 days in a row. There was no Sabbath. Uh, not that I would have known what one was like in the first place, but there was no Sabbath. It was two hours, and it was, it was intense. Her brother's actually very, very bright, so once we got going, it was, it was, it was okay. He got a... Uh, but anyway, uh, after um, we were done, the homecoming queen would always ask me if I'd like a cup of tea or something, hang around and talk for a while. And of course, I did. So we got to know each other very well. Over the summer, her, her brother got a D on his third quiz, C on the fourth, B on the fifth. The next two he got A's on, and he ended up with a B in the course. So... Uh, uh, and it, it was uh, very lucrative. I was paid $50 for my efforts, uh, about 50 cents an hour. Uh, but at the end of the summer, the homecoming queen decided I wasn't uh, as bad as most nerds. Uh, <clears throat> graduate studies and, and marriage. Uh, now, I'm uh, getting ready to go to graduate school, and um, I'm thinking I'm going to go to Caltech, the second California Institute of Technology, the second greatest nerd university in the world. Or maybe to Stanford, where I'd grown up near and had some affection for. Um, I'm thinking about this, and um, the homecoming queen is a year behind me, and, and I'm going to go to California. I'm going back to the promised land. I mean, that's, you know, I'd have enough of Boston. You know, that was, it, it, was, it helped me, but it, 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 I didn't like it very much there. I'm going to the promised land, but I'm thinking about this. She is going to be in western New York. I'm going to be in the promised land. There's about 2,500 miles in between. And she's going to find somebody from Cornell University, just 25 miles down the road, who uh, would like to have a beautiful wife and is not a nerd, and, uh, and it's, it's just not going to work. So I asked her if she'd marry me. <laughs> and she said, well, um, let me talk to my father about it. Now, I had not asked her, her father because I knew what the answer was going to be. <laughs> I mean, there's some questions that don't need to be asked. Uh, and so she talked to her father about this because she's going to have to leave school a year early. And he said, well, you can get married. Uh, he said, I don't mind if you marry a nerd. You know, I'm kind of nerdy myself. He was, the, he was one of the most distinguished, uh, he probably was the most distinguished um, thoracic surgeon in western Michigan. He was a nerd. Uh, and he said that didn't bother him, but she was going to have to get a, 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 good, um, a good degree from a <clears throat> respected university. Now, at that point, I had already accepted to go to graduate school at Caltech. And I'm thinking about this. Her major was art history. At that time, Caltech didn't offer a course in art history, much less a major. So that wasn't going to work. And all this is going around. And the, the professor who was recruiting me from Stanford called me up and said, Schaefer, uh, you haven't sent us in your acceptance yet. What's the problem? And I said, well, the problem is I've accepted at Caltech. Uh, and he said, are you sure? And I said, well, and I told him the whole story. And he said, Schaefer, <clears throat> do you know that Stanford University has one of the best art history departments in the nation? And I said, no, I didn't have a clue. I'm just a nerd. Uh, and uh, he said to me, okay, well, let's talk about this. Is she smart? Much smarter than I, I said. Have her send me her transcript. 
Three weeks later, without applying to Stanford University, she received a letter from the registrar saying, we would love to have you join us as an art history major for your final year of studies at Stanford University. And that was rare. Believe me, they, don't, they do not want to take, uh, they do not want to take uh, transfer students in their fourth year. And she did finish in, uh, in, in a year. So, um, yeah, so, gee, I hope this, yeah, okay, so I, I you know, I, I told you that already. Um, amazing story. MIT nerd marries the homecoming queen. Guys, there's hope. There's hope. Uh, I gave this talk in Montevideo, Uruguay, uh, at, their, at their huge auditorium in the middle of, a, of the city. And uh, this was, uh, homecoming queen was not a term that was very familiar to them. And one of the professors who studied in America said, that means princess. And their eyes all lit up. And, and it's true. And I told the homecoming queen when I got home that they described her as a princess. She said, that's much better than being a homecoming queen. There she is. Yeah. <laughs> This is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> this, is, this is too good to be real. Uh, just amazing. So there we are in the church <clears throat> coming out. She's looking beautiful and radiant, and I am looking like a nerd. <laughs> I am. Oh, this was so amazing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, as she is walking up to the, I'm up, up at the front of the church like the uh, husband-to-be is supposed to be. She is walking up. You could just hear people say, I can't believe she's doing this. <laughs> and we're walking out together, and they're saying, I can't believe she did this. <laughs> so it was a, what we call in physics an improbable event. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we leave for California, and here we are back in the promised land for, for two and a half years at Stanford University. Here's the um, most prominent architectural feature of the Stanford University campus. Uh, Stanford Memorial Church is at the end of Palm Drive, which comes from Palo Alto, which is now a very, very wealthy city. And um, there's nothing between Palo Alto and, and, uh, and the church but big palm trees. It's a gorgeous view. And of course, the picture is, I guess you can't see it, the picture is Jesus Christ uh, surrounded by his closest friends. Teachers at Stanford, I'm going to let that let this pass too. But Frank Harris is the one who told me that Stanford had a great art history department. Uh, and uh, okay, now this is not, we had, uh, we had dinner with seven scholars and uh, three professors and one gentleman who is one of your big bosses. Is that you right back there? Yeah. He's, if you don't know it, he's the, he's big around here. Yeah. He's, he's the vice president for academic affairs. Yeah, that's the number two position in our university, per se. So, uh, and, uh, and we like him, too. Yeah, I met him before, before he became famous. And, uh, and, and, and we like him. We, uh, I'm getting a, uh, I, I talked to the seven students and a few faculty members, uh, and I told them uh, a little bit about my pre-Christian uh, history. And... Um, Easter Sunday, my wife and I attended church at a small church across the street from Stanford University, across the street from the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator. Um, beautiful little redwood church. The pastor was from, uh, 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 from England. John Burns was his name. And uh, this was Easter Sunday. You know, I mean, we, um, you know, people from the Midwest go to church on Easter Sunday, so we went. Uh, he opened his speech with words that have an enormous, have had an enormous impact on my life. He said, the Christian faith is not true if Jesus Christ did not rise physically from the dead. And um, after everybody had left the church, I went up and talked to him a little bit. I said, you know, that first sentence of your speech was pretty good. And I said, do you really believe that? And he said, I do. Do you believe it? And I said, well, I haven't really given it much thought. Uh, he said, well, you should. <laughs> and, uh, and he suggested some things to read, which I took in very slowly. Um, but I did begin to read about the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's still going to be four years before I receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This is a, this is a long journey. I talked some, about, some more about this journey to these seven students, um, and I, I don't have time to do much more about that. But uh, <clears throat> time goes on. 
I started my third year PhD studies. I, I needed to find a job because my professor was moving to the University of Utah and uh, my wife and I did not want to go to the University of Utah. She had a great, uh, she graduated in art history with a, a sterling degree and decided to become an elementary school teacher and she had a, a great job and didn't want to go to Utah. So um, I interviewed for faculty positions, three places, MIT, um, Berkeley and Harvard University. Three good options, got a great offer from Berkeley. At the time, the most outstanding chemistry department in the world. They dipped a bit when I left, Bill. They dipped a bit. They're back in number one position again. They've recovered. They've recovered. Uh, and so I took the offer and accepted it at age 24. Uh, now, I became the youngest professor at the University of California at Berkeley. And I, in that role, I succeeded somebody who came, who came to be much, much more famous than I. So I should say a little bit about that person. I think it's here. Yeah, I was the, yeah, I've already said that. Now, uh-oh, <laughs> some people know, you're not supposed to know who this is yet. Come on now, no, uh, no recognition of this name. I'm not even going to say this person's name. Uh, he became the Unabomber. He looks like a clean-cut kid, doesn't he? The year he comes to, uh, to Berkeley, the guy was a genius. I, I don't know if he, he was a genius. I mean, now he had some problems at Berkeley. Um, the students didn't like him. He didn't like the students. Faculty didn't like him. He didn't like the faculty. Uh, so when he announced that he was going to leave, you'd think there would be uh, a lot of people that were happy. Well, the provost, this is equivalent to the provost right back there, was not happy about this. He said, Kaczynski, we want you to stay. And he talked about how he didn't like students, didn't like the faculty, they didn't like him. He said, we will put you in a little ivory tower. You'll never need to interact with any students or any faculty. Your only job is to win the Fields Prize. That's the mathematical, mathematics equivalent of the Nobel Prize. And he said, nope, I'm done with this place. He went off to live in uh, Missouri. And uh, there he is when he was arrested. So, uh, this guy's become more popular because there was some kind of a TV series uh, uh, about him. He became the Unabomber. He thought this was, it was good sport. He hated technology. The way in which he got caught was quite interesting, but some of you have seen the, the uh, TV series, so I'm not going not to talk about that. But um, yeah, he still tries to get out every year, but uh, you know, he killed, killed three people and maimed another 20, so he's not getting out of jail uh, anytime soon. Um, I replaced the Unabomber. <laughs> I'm there for 18 years. I'm there for 18 years, and it's, it's a good time. Uh, here's the, uh, the, the Berkeley campus is a pretty campus. It's a small campus, but it's very pretty. It's getting less pretty because they keep building new buildings. Uh, I was there two weeks ago and they just knocked down one of the old buildings and putting something huge up there. This is where you enter the campus from um, Bancroft Avenue and Telegraph. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty campus. Lots and lots of redwood trees. Uh, now, am I ready for that? Um, no. So I'm, I'm not a Christian yet. It hasn't happened yet. I'm, I'm, I'm a lost soul on the Berkeley campus along with lots of others. Uh, I was in good company, you might say. Uh, now I'm going to say a little bit about chemistry here. Not too much, but a little bit. The um, Nobel Prize in Chemistry was given in 1971 to Gerhard Hertzberg, Canadian, uh, German-born uh, Canadian scientist. And this is how his Nobel Prize... I'm going to go over here because there are a lot more of you over here. Uh, this, is how, this is how his Nobel Prize was described. Hertzberg's main contributions are the field of atomic and molecular spectroscopy. He and his associates have determined the structures of a large number of diatomic and polyatomic molecules, including the structures of many free radicals. Difficult to determine in any other way. Among these, those of free methyl, CH3, and free methylene, CH2. So that's what he got the Nobel Prize for. Um, this is my most important paper. I published this paper during my first year at MIT, and we could talk a long time about this. It was published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, one of the, the great journals in the world, with my friend Charles Bender, who worked for a computing company. That's a story that could go on for a long time also. And uh, what was it about this paper? This was a paper in theoretical chemistry, the field George Whitesides instructed me to enter into. 
And uh, now this is five years after we made this discovery. Uh, it's um, a statement by two famous chemists in a, in a book called Carbenes. It's in 1970. Bender and Schaefer reported by far the most elaborate calculation to date on methylene or indeed most any molecules. These were the very early days of, of quantum chemistry. Bender and I were both nerds, uh, just sucking up equations, turning them into computer programs, and, and we did this thing, which was a huge improvement over what had been done before. Now, what's it about? This is what Hertzberg said the structure was, and this is what he got the Nobel Prize in chemistry for. He said the molecule was linear. That's what Bender and I said, and uh, we weren't very respectful in our, in our paper. We said uh, there must have been some uh, incorrect interpretation by Hertzberg of his experiments. These were electronic spectroscopy, and the real structure of the molecule is 135 degrees. And fortunately for us, as I think Bill alluded to, fortunately for us, a couple of experiments came along very quickly, and uh, we turned out to, to be right. So um, but if, if that prediction had been wrong, Two out of every three assistant professors at Berkeley has to leave after four or five or six years, and I would have been one of them for certain. Uh, I didn't realize so much was at stake at the time. We just had these new theoretical methods and wanted to use them on some molecule that seemed interesting. Here's another statement. Now, this is now 15 years after we make this discovery. This is from uh, my friend Bill Goddard, professor at Caltech. I would have gone to work for Bill Goddard if, uh, if I hadn't... Uh, Asked the homecoming queen to marry me. Uh, so, and this is what he says. Uh, Fifteen years after, everyone believed. Now, everyone, you know, is a word that you always have to understand the context. Everybody, all chemistry nerds, all chemistry nerds, believed CH2 to be linear until accurate theoretical studies finally led Bender and Schaefer to insist in 1970 that CH2 is bent by 125 degrees. Indirect experimental evidence for such highly bent CH2 came quickly. Well, this keeps going on. You know, if you do one good thing in science, you can ride it. And why not? Uh, this is now 22 years after this discovery. The, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry in London uh, gives me a, a, a nice award uh, and describes me as the first theoretical chemist to successfully challenge the conclusions of a distinguished experimental group for a polyatomic molecule, namely methylene. Okay, finally convinced. During my third year on the faculty... At Berkeley, the historical evidence compelled me to accept the truth of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. I finally understood that the resurrection of Christ is one of the best attested facts in all of ancient history. About one year later, I received Jesus Christ into my life. We told a little bit of that story at dinner to the, uh, to the, the, the seven students um, and a few others. A number of things in my life began to change. My life had a purpose to know Jesus Christ, make him known. Here's the Berkeley faculty in 1986. This is, uh, yeah, this, how do you get 49 men and one woman to smile at the same time? They took a lot of photographs to get this, this picture, but uh, let's see. I am, see if you can find me in here. I didn't have my beard then. Uh, I'll, I'll go over here where the, where the home team is. Uh, they, uh, oh, I don't know if you can see me. I'm, I'm next to somebody really famous, Glenn Seaborg. Glenn Seaborg uh, and his team discovered most of the elements in the periodic table between 93 and 100. And in fact, element 106 is named after Glenn Seaborg. It's Seaborgium. Chemistry professor is nodding. Yeah, so he's really famous. And he helped me in a lot of sticky situations. But uh, he's right. No, he's right there. And I'm right there. Yeah, I didn't have any hair. I mean, yeah. My wife married me. I had some hair. It went quickly. <laughs> it went quickly. It was gone within five years. She, yeah, she, she always tells me she thinks I look good, and, and I'm, I wonder if she's in delusion. Uh, I mean, I am a nerd uh, through and through. And proud of it, I might say, for the purpose. Now, colleagues at Berkeley, we're not going to talk about these. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, Glenn Seaborg discovered the new elements and helped me out of a very difficult jam involving computers uh, during my third year in the faculty. Yep. Well, there was a year of rebellion. Went to the University of Texas uh, at Austin. Um, 
wasn't quite sure. My wife and I are not quite sure we wanted our kids to grow up in, in Berkeley, the uh, site of many riots, for those of you that followed uh, some of the history of that uh, Vietnam era. Here's the state capital, Austin. It's pretty cool. Uh, spent a year there. Uh, I had a great job. Uh, uh, I was director of a new institute for theoretical chemistry. I had a chaired professorship. But um, uh, we, we missed Berkeley, so uh, we went back and stayed there another seven years before we moved to the University of Georgia. This is four years after I met Professor Bordeaux. In the same year, he left Miami and, uh, and, and, and came here. So he came to Athens, Georgia, which is uh, uh, moving south. Uh, I, I was offered a position really quite similar to the one I'd had so briefly at the University of Texas, but now we were sure we didn't want our kids growing up in, in, in Berkeley. Kids, faculty kids, uh, one of my closest friends has three daughters and two of them, he doesn't know where they are. I mean, they're, they're gone. He, 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 doesn't know, he doesn't know where they are. I mean, it's, it's not a wholesome situation for young people. I don't think I say that here. We wanted a quieter place to live, had four kids, moved to Athens, Georgia, which I describe as the best college town on the planet. I don't dare do this too close to Ann Arbor, uh, but Athens, Georgia is cooler than, uh, than our, it's, it's more separate. It's, it's, it's further from Atlanta by a good bit than uh, Ann Arbor is from Detroit, and Atlanta is a nicer place to live than Detroit, too. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful college town, 150,000 people, um, great football team. I'll come back to that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great place to be. And that is why four of your graduates have come to do their PhDs at the University of Georgia, and they are all, well, Michael probably will be, become a professor at, uh, at the, the Evil Empire uh, uh, Taylor next year, but the others are all distinguished chemistry professors as well. So they've, they came in superbly well prepared, and, and that preparation continued. I'm not going to talk about my colleagues at the University of Georgia in a general audience, but we have some good ones. Uh, these, these, these people are all super good scientists. Um, seven or eight really good ones in the department. We had about 30 in the Department of Berkeley. So it's not as many uh, really gifted chemists as we had at, at Berkeley, but they're, uh, I talk to all these people most every day uh, when we're there. Travel. One of the great joys in life, being a scientist, opportunity to travel to interesting parts of the world and collaborate with scientists from many countries. Professor Bordeaux went to Labrie. What year was that? 2005. 2005. He spent a sabbatical at, uh, at Labrie and other places as well in, in Europe. It's a good thing. Travel is a, is a good thing. Um, so I've traveled uh, over 100 trips to, uh, to Europe. Um, that is the most beautiful place in the world, in my opinion. Now, everybody has a place that, that they think is the most beautiful, but that's it. I, I love high mountain lakes. This is 6,000 feet. This is Sils Maria, Switzerland. We're at 6,000 feet, and uh, with the mountains going up to 14,000 all around, and my wife and I love to hike, and, uh, and so we, we, we spent three weekends there this summer while we were at the University of Munich. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful place. We've been at the University of Munich for um, eight summers now. Yep, that's, that's the university right there. Uh, and uh, it's a great university, a great place to spend the summer. Uh, I uh, was bribed to go there by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. They're a foundation that, that pays good money for scientists not from Germany to come and spend some time in Germany, and we have spent all our time in the, in the summers when I don't have to be teaching at, at, at Georgia. And we, we have stumbled into uh, some of the best universities in the world. As I said, chem, uh, Berkeley at, at chemistry was the best, uh, <clears throat> but other places, I've, this LMU Munich, the place where we've been spending these summers, is the best in Germany. Uh, did I go there because it was the best university in Germany? No. Not a chance. I went there because Christian Oxenfeld, uh, a, a young theoretical chemist, is a genius. And I go there to teach his students and to be taught by them. So I, not because it's a great university. I went there because it's a great research group. Um, many trips to China. Professor Bordeaux and I have been to the same places. 
at times. Uh, here's, you know, here we are in China. There's the Great Wall, the only thing you can see from space, apparently. Uh, I started a, <coughs> a center with the same name as mine uh, in, uh, in Guangzhou, China. I, I like Guangzhou. You must have been to Guangzhou at some time. It's a beautiful city. It's a big city. It's got a lot of people in it. But the river is fantastic, Pearl River. And another institute a couple years later in Chengdu in Sichuan province. Australia, many trips. I love Australia. I spent three years of my life in Australia with the homecoming queen. Yeah, of course. And uh, we most, oh, here's the most famous thing to see in Australia. It's the uh, Sydney Opera House and the uh, Harbour Bridge. We went there first in 75. This opera house had just been built. Everybody hated it. They thought it was the ugliest thing they'd ever seen. And now they all love it. It's famous all over the world. So opinions change. Um, and, uh, you know, Australia, most of our time has actually been spent at the Australian National University in Canberra, which is an inland city, the only inland city in Australia, and it's the, it's the capital. We like it. It's a man-made city. Um, but uh, it's a university that actually has gone downhill. I mean, it was the best of the best by far. We started going there in 1975, but uh, egalitarianism slipped in, and now it's just a good regional university. Um, it was the most distinguished university in the South, so it is not now. Uh, my host has been Professor Leo Radom, a, a dear friend of mine in the chemistry department, but he um, moved, his wife hated it in Canberra, so he moved to, uh, to, to Sydney and uh, has been professor there for the last 10 years, and so... Uh, and uh, his successor, as he's just retired, is Peter Gill, who is a, um, uh, a, a deeply committed Christian man. In fact, we had a meeting of uh, Christians in chemistry last week, last week Monday in San Diego, a wonderful group of about 50 people, and, and Peter Gill gave a wonderful testimony of his faith in Christ. So when your two professors, chemistry professors, come to the national ACS meeting, you need to show up 5.30 Monday evening because we have a a special group of people who, who gather there. Um, so Sydney is where we go now. I'll be in Sydney at the end of this month. India, many trips, many trips. Here's, here's the Charminar in, uh, in Hyderabad. This is the most famous, one of the most famous architectural features in all of, of, uh, of India. And um, I, can, I, I better move along because Becky can be tough. You know, she's, where is she, where'd she go? Oh, she's gone. Becky, are you gone? Oh, I was going to tell this story. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to tell this story because of her. If you want to hear this story about India, it's a really good story. You'll have to, uh, have to, have to wait because she's like the police, I'm telling you. It's uh, wonderful scientific collaborators in India. We've published good papers with all four of these people. Dear friends, um, the first one, Jemis is a Christian. Others are not. A few trips to Africa, not too many. Um, my friend there is uh, Kevin Naidu, professor at the University of Cape Town. Again, the best, best uh, university in Africa. Why did I go there? Because of the best university? No, I went there because Kevin was my friend, and I, he invited me to give some lectures, and it was fun. This is, um, anybody know what that mountain in the back is? Table Mountain, it's, it's flat as a bone. You can walk around up there, but you need to be careful. There are a lot of cobras up there. They, they like Table Mountain. And uh, my wife does not like snakes, especially rattlesnakes, because one almost bit her on the Appalachian Trail a couple of years ago. So she, she's not walking around on Table Mountain. And if she's not walking around on Table Mountain, I'm not walking around on Table Mountain. South America, quite a few trips. A lot of trips to Santiago, Chile, where the Catholic University is and is, a, is the best uh, university in, in, in South America. A same story, not because, didn't go there because it was famous, but Alejandro Torralabe, wonderful collaborator, wanted me to come, and, and I was curious. <clears throat> Santiago looks like this about three days a year. The Andes, uh, going up to 22,000 feet, are about 50 miles away. So you don't see them regularly. This, this beautiful skyline is has more buildings on it now, but it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. Many visits to Catholic University. I'm not Catholic, and uh, he's not Catholic either, but uh, this wonderful scientific collaboration with uh, Professor Alejandro Torralabi. I've taken two of his students to be my PhD students, um, 
and uh, he's taken one of my students to be his PhD student. So many, many visits back and forth. Um, Alejandro's a tremendous guy. The poor guy, he's head of the, uh, he's dean of science now. You know, it can happen. It can happen. He had a good reason to become dean, though. I'm not, not, I'm not insulting the distinguished-looking gentleman in the back there. But he did have a good, as a, he, had a, he, he was approaching 65, which was mandatory retirement. The only way for him to avoid retirement was to become the dean. And as the dean, he can continue doing his scientific research as well as doing that stuff. So he bought another five years of his career by being the dean. The best excuse I've ever heard for being a dean. Um, other scientific visits to Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Uruguay, beautiful countries. Yeah, so Catholic University ends up the best in uh, Latin America, no thanks to me. Uh, this is something that nerds, academic nerds will understand. This is about citations. A citation is when somebody makes mention of your work in their own paper. So a lot of people have made mention of our work. Uh, there's no need to belabor this. Now this, we are not, not going to belabor. I might have time to tell my story about India. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe not. Top 10 papers. Um, our most important paper has only received 120 citations. Oh, maybe it's 125. So the number of times you get cited isn't necessarily, well, is not directly proportional to the importance of what you do. But it's a, it's a factor. We continue with there. Okay, I'm getting ready to finish. Um, I'm going back and tell you that India story, okay? Yeah, I, I'm going back there. Yeah, I'm going to do it. This is a great story. So I'm invited to the University of Hyderabad by my friend, Professor Jemis. I told you he's the, one of my collaborators who's a Christian there. And um, I get to Bombay. It was called Bombay. It's called Mumbai now, but this is 96 or something like that. And uh, I, uh, uh, I, I get off the plane. I get my bags through. And somebody says to me, Professor Schaefer, will you come into this little room over here? I said, why not? I go into the room and they explain, but Professor Schaefer, do you, do you know that you came here without a visa to India? I said, visa? India and the United States are the best of friends. Why would I need a visa? And he said, well, you make us have a visa to come and visit you, and we have this reciprocity deal, whereas you have to have one to come and visit us. So, uh, but we've talked to Delta Airlines. Uh, they're happy to take you back. The same plane you came on is going back, and they won't charge you any additional money for the trip back. Wow. I said, well, let me have my professor call you. So Professor Jemis calls the, um, calls the, the police uh, department and says that they really need to have me come. Talks for a half hour. It doesn't work. And he says, let me have the president of the university call you. President of the university, um, Professor Mehta, is, is also a chemist, a famous organic chemist, and he calls and talks for about 20 minutes, and they say, okay, we'll let you in for three days. So I get in. I asked, uh, I asked Meta, I was in, Meta went to, um, um, he went to uh, be the president of, uh, of the Indian Association of Science in, in Bangalore. Very, very distinguished position. And when he was there, I, I saw him and said, you know, how did you do that? That was now 20 years have gone by. How did you get me into India? back then. He said, oh, well, I told a lie. <laughs> I said, well, interesting. What kind of lie did you say? He said, I told him you're going to get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I said, well, it worked. Um, so uh, that was my first, uh, first visit to, uh, to India, and it's been, a, it's been a wonderful thing. So we're going to go on back to where I was here. So, um, yeah, okay. I told you my art, my uh, wife studied art history at Stanford. And she takes me to museums and shows me wonderful things. I always have her do the research first to find the, the five most famous works of art. And I bring a book with me. I see the five most famous works of art, and I sit down and read whatever I have with me. Uh, so let's finish with four great paintings. And this one is Michelangelo. It's the Sistine Chapel in, in Rome. I call this initiative. God, uh, God has... Um, God offers a wonderful plan for each human being's life, and uh, his initiative comes first. This is, this is, uh, this is the, the figurative finger of God reaching down to Adam. God's initiative comes first, but there's a problem, separation from God. And this is, a, this is also a famous painting by Hieronymus Bosch, and it is gruesome. This is a gruesome picture. 
very famous, but gruesome. I get over here to the title and I can read it. It's called The Garden of Earthly Delights. I hope you don't see this too clearly because it's got every horrible thing going on in this, in this piece of art as imaginable. And it's got a, a Satan figure seated on this throne. You'll see, you'll see uh, him. And, uh, but what Hieronymus Bosch is trying to describe is that we are separated. Our, our, uh, our, our selfishness separates us from, from, from God. The most um, easily discernible characteristic of the human race is selfishness. If you haven't discovered that, you need to. It took me a while to discover it, uh, but I got it finally separated from Christ. Now, um, here's um, Salvador Dali. This is 1931, uh, the, uh, the resurrection. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous painting. It talks about the solution, how Jesus uh, took the penalty for our sins, or the sins of all who give their lives to him on the cross. And, uh, and then necessary response. Here's Rembrandt. The return of the prodigal son. There's a sense in which each of us has to uh, return uh, to uh, God the Father through Jesus Christ to obtain this free gift of, uh, of eternal life. So I show this to um, audiences wherever I go, and many of them have few or no Christians, but I explain to them this is the, basically the Christian message. Oh, where's the homecoming queen been all these years I've been a nerd? She's been teaching, uh, teaching school. She... she uh, Taught, she's still teaching. She taught kindergarten for many, many years uh, because she, in her school, Westminster Christian Academy, they taught reading in, in kindergarten. And she was, and you can see the students just love her. Love her. They're, uh, yeah, they're uh, great. And one of these young ladies in the back row, second from the right, we, is Kara, we still use her as a babysitter. So uh, that's what she's been doing. Um, here I am with a very dear friend, Mark Richt. He was a University of Georgia head football coach for 15 years, most winning coach in the, in the history of uh, Georgia football. Lived around the corner from me, a, a deep and abiding commitment to Christ, and uh, we became friends very quickly. And here he came on my birthday and gave me this beautiful Georgia sweatshirt. Uh, he left uh, Georgia, coach at the University of Miami, had a, he became coach, coach of the year one year, won 15 games in a row, and after three years, he has retired from football, and uh, he's, uh, he's happy to be retired. I spent about a half hour with him at graduation of one of his, uh, his nephews, and uh, he likes not coaching. He's an announcer now, like they all become announcers, and so he's, it's, it's a lot less stressful than being... Uh, now, the next one is my last photograph, and um, it's a picture of my wife and me with the third most influential person in the world. Yeah, so here we are with the third. I, I don't know a lot of influential people, to be honest. Uh, Chuck Colson was a very good friend of mine. He's famous. He's with the Lord now. Uh, Mark Rick's a famous guy. Uh, but even more famous is this person, Angela Merkel, the uh, chancellor of uh, Germany for a long, long time. And uh, she's uh, been very influential, and she's been very good. As the, as the Prime Minister of uh, Germany. Why are we in this picture with her at her, at, her, at her country home? Well, for starters, she's a nerd. She has a PhD in quantum chemistry. And the story of how, the, the story she told us one evening <clears throat> about how she got from her PhD in quantum chemistry to be the Chancellor of Germany is a, is a good one, which I don't have time to, to tell. That doesn't explain the whole thing. She hasn't been a quantum chemist for a long time. Next to her is another nerd, Joachim Zauer, a very good friend of mine. He's an outstanding quantum chemist, and uh, we've been in meetings together four times this year already, so we see a lot of each other. And uh, he's been to visit us at our university, given our most uh, distinguished lecture. And um, he, uh, he um, wrote to me, emailed me, this picture is from three years ago, I think, uh, four years ago, and said, uh, we want you to come to the annual meeting of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science in Berlin, and uh, after the meeting, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go and have a, a, a hike uh, with my wife. And uh, so we did it, went to the meeting. Uh, it was okay. We uh, were done. Minivan comes and picks us up, and off we go. About an hour drive north of, uh, north of Berlin. This is in the old East Germany. She grew up in the old East Germany. Her father was a pastor. And um, we get to 
to a place where there's a one-lane road that's dirt, and it's barely one lane. Uh, I don't know what would have happened if we'd uh, run into somebody there. And we get to this little village of seven houses. She comes bouncing out, asking, acting like we're her best friends in the world. And we'd, we'd never met her. And but we were there for seven hours. Had a wonderful time with her. We went on the, wike, on the hike. My wife walked with her and talked about all kinds of uh, things together. It was a, it was a, a special time. So, uh, yeah, I think... Oh, Bill, you forgot to sell my book. Oh, we're going to sell my book during the questions. Okay, then, uh, then I will say it's been great to be here again. I'll be here tomorrow morning if anybody wants to talk about anything. And uh, thank you for coming. We're going to have Q&A here in just a second, but first I'm going to let... Um, Bill, sell the book. Okay. I'm not sure how we're going to figure this out, but uh, it's a great book. I've read it, and I've given a bunch of them away. Uh, Fritz has uh, one copy of his book, uh, Conf- Science and Christianity, Conflict or Coherence. Lots of great quotes from lots of science guys from, what, the 15th century on maybe at least, something like that, and uh, some really good, good content. So for somebody who is going to promise to read the entire book, we're going to give this one away. And for everybody else, if you want one, go to Amazon and you can buy one. <laughs> now, I don't know how we figure out. You guys are going to have to help me out. I think, I think uh, Dr. Baker and Dr. Now you're going to have to be judges or something. Uh, I'm too old. Give it to them for safekeeping. Any, any oh. I think there's a few. All right, we have some time um, for a few questions for Dr. Schaefer. So uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll come running. Oh, wow, that's far. Okay. Thank you for your time, and uh, it was good to hear from you. Your story was great, and I love Australia as well. Now, are you standing up? Yes. I can't tell. Are you, you're, in, <laughs> you're really in the cheap seats back there. Yeah, it's a nosebleed, actually. Yeah, cl- closer to God than the po- podium. Thank you. <laughs> so my question for you is uh, just a personal opinion, I guess. What would you say the... Uh, biggest relationship between science and the Christian faith is? What the basis is? No, no, no. What's your opinion? Be, like, what's the relationship between science and religion, in your opinion? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, religion's a big topic. Um, and uh, uh, so I... Uh, I could talk a lot about that, but as I always say when I go to um, Hindu or, or Muslim or Buddhist countries, that I don't show up to criticize anybody else's religion. Uh, so I don't talk about them, but the relationship between science and Christianity is, is, a, uh, is a, um, a long and intense relationship. Um, and uh, as I point out in, this, in this, this book that you can buy on Amazon, uh, <laughs> Uh, it, it really it begins with the beginning of the modern physical sciences with, with Francis Bacon talking about the two books, uh, the book of Scripture and the book of God's creation or nature, and uh, saying that we need to become intimately familiar with both. It begins there and it goes right on up to the, the current time. Most of what we know as, the, as modern science was instigated by persons of, of Christian belief. So I think we have a good... good uh, Good record there, uh, past, present, and God willing, future. Thank you. Somebody have their hand up over here. I wanted to 
ask you how old you think the world is. Well, <clears throat> how old do you think the world is? I'll give you two opinions. I'll start out with my wife's. Uh, she um, thinks the world is no more than 10,000 years old. Okay? I think our universe is about 13.8 billion years of age. Now, I'll be home tomorrow night with the homecoming queen, and I guarantee you the first thing we're going to talk about is not the age of the earth. Uh, so I don't think this is, a, this is a, a, um, an issue that uh, should separate Christians. I'm not an evolutionist. I do, I do need to say that. I'm not an evolutionist. I think that, that uh, the creation of Adam and the creation of Eve are, were literal events that took place as described in, uh, in, in Genesis. So I'm not an evolutionist, but I, I do think the universe is old. I'm an old earth creationist. My wife is a young earth creationist. We get along well. Do we have to get the book in order to know what the historical evidence is behind the resurrection of Jesus that compelled you to believe? Yeah, thank you. No, you don't. <clears throat> you don't. Uh, the reason I want to sell the book is we just have a few left and I'm going to have a chance to uh, do a third edition. Um, the evidence. The evidence. Um, of the apostles <clears throat> the evidence appears to be good that only the apostle John died of natural causes the others were all executed one way or another I think the evidence that uh, that Thomas was killed in India is pretty good I've been to the place in uh, in uh, uh, in um, Tamil Nadu Madras, now uh, Chennai, uh, where he appears to have been, been murdered. I think that's, it was a long way to go from, uh, from Israel to, uh, but I think that's right. And, and I, I think the evidence is, is strong and, and uh, avoiding death would have been pretty simple. Just say, no, we made it up. He didn't rise from the dead. We know where he's buried. We made it up. We just thought it was a good story. We thought he was a good person. We thought that his teachings would help people. We made it up and there wouldn't have been executed. So that's the single, uh, to me, most uh, convincing uh, piece of, of, of evidence. I think the, the New Testament is written as history, and uh, it should be taken that way. They want you to get a little exercise here. Now, do you know that this professor is a product of the University of Georgia? And we talked about all kinds of Georgia things at lunch, didn't we? Yeah, we went to the same church uh, until she, uh, she was part of planning a, a new church from our church. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure um, that a lot of your peers and your colleagues are atheists. And um, have you ever had any people, like, look down on you because of your faith? And how do you respond and defend your work and your faith when people do that, if they have done that? Well, it's, it's rare Rick Smalley, it, it, it is a rare person that he would tell me up front that he was an atheist and thought I was lost my mind. Uh, he did that until he became a Christian. Um, but I have heard interesting stories. I had a student, uh, we have a lot of students from the Midwest. Uh, they, they're, uh, yeah, a lot of people, from, we have uh, the, the group that just came in, two from Indiana, one from uh, Minnesota and one from the Promised Land, California, which is not so promising as it was. Uh, but uh, a couple of years ago, a student joined my research group and he wanted to tell me about an experience he'd had during the fall semester of his senior year. He said he was at a big state university. I'm not going to name it because the, you might get back to where this story came from. And he said he'd gone to his advisor, who was a theoretical chemist, told him he wanted to do theoretical chemistry, and said he'd heard that uh, the University of Georgia was just the best. And his professor said to him, well, it, it is the best, but you don't want to go there. The, the main professor there is a religious fanatic. The student walked out of his office and said, that's it, I'm going to Georgia. <laughs> so these things don't always turn out the way that, uh, 
that people might think. But there's a lot of that out there. Not too much in your face to me. Uh, you know, not, 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 not too much of that. But, uh, yeah, there's, there's stuff out there. Sure. You said that uh, it was about a year between the historical evidence convincing you that Jesus was historically resurrected and you accepting Christ. Was, was that just a natural process that happened after, or was there something else that happened to cause that? No, it was gradual. Once I uh, uh, realized that Jesus had risen from the dead, uh, I had much more motivation to uh, thinking about the Christian faith. And so that led to a, uh, a more general thinking about things, and in time it happened. We can take one more question. So with the newer discoveries in the field of science supporting the, the Bible story, do you foresee any change specifically in public schools on the teaching of evolution and that sort of thing? Uh, I don't think so. I don't see the, any changes coming in the teaching of evolution. There would have to be a, a change in the, uh, in the general community. And it is true that uh, among university professors, biologists tend to be the most skeptical. Uh, they, 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 a, a lot of them have kind of defined their communities like a medieval guild uh, in which uh, if, if you were a, a, a weaver, you know, you could get in, but there's just a few jobs like that, and they all chose the ones that agreed with them about everything else. So, no, I don't see that. Uh, I don't see a change coming there any time in the future. Yeah. Uh, let's thank Dr. Schaefer. Oh, oh not yet. Not yet. Never mind, let's not. I have to make some closing remarks. Okay. I have to make some, uh, sorry, Becky. <laughs> We've become good friends. She's been sending me emails for about a year now, and uh, without telling me, she's a University of Georgia Bulldog, and, uh, and we get there to lunch at Nick's, and I'm getting my hamburger, and, uh, and uh, it comes out. And, all kind, and then we're going to the same church, didn't know each other, it's a big church. Okay, my concluding remarks. During the fourth year of my 18 years as professor at the University of California at Berkeley, Jesus Christ came into my life. My life had a purpose to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. C.S. Lewis's autobiography of his early life is called Surprised by Joy, and uh, I share that joy that he found. There is a great, great joy in Jesus. Thanks for coming. <laughs>